Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Money's just there. Okay, so um, today's class is going to be a little bit different than what we've talked about throughout the semester because so far we've mostly been discussing about, okay, here's the internals of a database system at the, like, sort of the, the lowest levels and how to make you know, queries run faster. And so today's going to be a different, uh, you know, a different topic where that we're going to be further up the stack now in the system where we're going to do a bunch of tricks up in the, you know, before we even get to the query optimizer when the SQL query shows up. And how to make run make you know the query runs faster given the the architecture we designed below, and so this will then be from this point going into the semester, like for this lecture, our next lecture will be about getting things in and out of the database quickly. And then next week we'll spend uh, a lot more time on the query optimizer. And I know I, I need to update, uh, finally post the papers we'll be reading for next week, um, but I'll take care of that today or tomorrow. So just a reminder before the break, we we spent two lectures discussing join algorithms. And we discussed how to do parallel hash joins because I said that's what you know, every database system needs to be able to do hash joins. Right? If you're relational, you're sorting SQL, you need joins. And hash joins is, always good, is going to be the fastest. Um, and then we spent a whole lecture talking about worst case optimal joins. And although very, very few systems do this now, this is something they're all going to need to support in, in, you know, within the next decade as people start doing you know, more graph-like things on, on their databases. All right, so today's, today's lecture, again, we're going to be focusing on how to, to embed more complicated things inside of a database system to execute queries. And I'll loosely categorize these as an embedded database logic. And so we've made the assumption that the, 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 the scenario that we're supporting in our conceptual database system is that there is a, there's an application or some, some tool that the user is using and they're, 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 they're interacting with the application. They're either typing raw SQL queries in or they're using a dashboard. And then the application is sending, sending over SQL queries that we then compute in their entirety and then send back, send back the result. And so the, the scope of what that query, those queries can, 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 can execute or, or operate on, the computation they can perform on our data, is limited to whatever the database system itself actually supports. And so in some cases, it's very common, especially in the, the Python pandas world, You'll see people just do select star queries to get all the data out of the data system, then bring it into your Jupyter notebook or pandas, whatever you want, then do some additional computation on it, and then push the result back to the database server. And so if we can avoid that, some cases we can, some cases we cannot. If we can avoid that, then obviously the database system will have a complete view of what you're trying to do in your query on your data, and it can optimize accordingly, assuming you have some of the techniques that we'll talk about today. Um, but you know, it, it is always going to be a better position to, 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 you know, it's always better to operate on the data where it resides rather than, than always having to bring it out to a, an external application. So this is what I mean by embedding the database logic. So the benefits are kind of obvious, right? Fewer network round trips, as I said. Like if I can just do one query, have all the c computation I need for whatever the result I'm looking for be in that single query request, then that's fantastic rather than having to go back and forth. Um, obviously, if now, uh, if, you know, if I'm incorporating changes, this maybe not so much matters in, in the lake house world on, you know, that we're talking about, but like, rather than me having a sort of a, a stale snapshot of my data that I'm processing locally, if I'm going to push all my computation to the database server, then as new things arrive, new data arrives, then I'll see those updates immediately. Um, again, we're not going to talk about transactions, but think, you know, if, if, if you, in a transaction world, if I call begin, run a query, get back a result, do some processing on the application side, the database server is holding locks while I'm doing that computation. So if I can push all my computation to the database server, then I don't have to go those, go those round trips. This one is, is debatable whether like you, uh, whether or not you're gonna, you're gonna allow your developers to, be, to not have to re-implement functionality by using embedded database logic. And I say it's debatable because oftentimes in, the, in sort of large corporations or enterprises, the, the people that write the application and build, build that software aren't the same people managing the database servers. So the application developers might be on one sort of engineering cycle, but the database, database developers are usually very conservative. And you may say, hey, here's, here's my new, here's my new, my new user, user defined function, UDF, or store procedure. But the DBA is like, well, I got to vet this. It's going to take a couple of weeks before this actually happens. So you end up having developers just re-implementing the same thing, just in different uh, code bases. Um, we certainly saw that in the case of the, the Velox paper, right? They talked about how 
there's what, 11 implementations of substring in all of Facebook. And then this last one, again, this, is, this encompasses all of this. But now we're going to be able to extend the functionality of the data system to go beyond what the built-in capabilities is. And this last one here is what the, one of the original motivations of user-defined types and user-defined functions that Stonebreaker likes to talk about. Like when he was building, when they, built, they built Ingress. They started giving, uh, trying to start selling it to a bunch of banks. But all the banks were computing interest for accounts on the Julian calendar, whereas you know, the rest of the world is running the Gregorian calendar. So in Ingress at the time, they didn't have a, a Julian date type. So that meant the developers had to go modify the data system to add this new date type. But if you can allow them to support, you define types, you define functions, and other things, then the developers can extend the system without having to recompile the binary. Right? So the type of, there's different categories of types of uh, embedded database logic. Um, the, the most common two are going to be user defined functions and store procedures. They're conceptually the same uh, thing, like it's a function of some kind of procedural code in, that you, you can run in your database server. The, the difference is that in a server procedure, you don't need to, you, don't, you can invoke it outside of a SQL query. Like I can call ex execute and then the name of the function and it'll just run it like, like an RPC call. Whereas in the EDF, it has to be embedded inside of a, uh, inside, inside of a uh, you know, select statement or a SQL query. In some systems like SQL Server, they make the distinction that user-defined functions cannot update tables. Like you can't call insert, update, delete in the UDF. Postgres doesn't let you do that, right? Whereas in a store procedure in SQL Server, you can only that's where you can call update queries, right? So again, a bunch of these everyone should be mostly familiar with, um, but the one we're going to care about today is user-defined functions. And this survey comes from the a follow-up paper from the Freud paper you guys read, uh, where they actually did a survey of real customer databases in Azure. And they just, they just counted you know, what, what, what a real UDFs and store procedures look like. And that's where they came up with this pie chart like this. All right, so a user write function, uh, this, can, this should be review for everyone here. User write function is basically, it's going to be a function that's going to be written by the application developer that allows us to extend the functionality of the database system uh, beyond its built in operations, built in functions. Right? So, so the SQL standard specifies there's a substring function. And every system that that's, you know, must support the SQL standard is going to have their own implementation of it. But if I have some weird, weird wonky substring version that I want to use for whatever reason, right, it's, it's not realistic for me to assume that my database server is going to have that. But I can write it as a user drive function to have the exact uh, capabilities that I want. And then I, then I can port my application technically anywhere. A lot of times when you see people that have like migration uh, services where like I'm running on Oracle and I want to switch to Postgres, I'm running a Teradata, I want to switch to Postgres or something, they'll take whatever the, the, the custom functions you're using from the different proprietary, proprietary database servers and they'll re-implement them as user-defined functions to, to ensure cap, uh, compatibility. All right, so the function is, is, is pretty straightforward, right? You can take some input arguments, always as scalers. Uh, you can perform some kind of computation on it. And then you can return a result either as a scalar or a table. For our purposes here, we're going to assume that the, uh, the, U the UDFs are um, not pure functions, uh, another neighbor. But basically, you can't, they're not going to call it outside things. In some database servers, you can actually make RPC calls to remote services. For our, to keep things simple today, we're going to assume that everything's going to run inside of the, 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 the function itself. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't escape. You know, we can call, one function can call other functions. All right, so again, conceptually it looks like this. This is our application. It wants to execute some SQL. That has some kind of program logic, with, you know, conditional clauses, whatever, calling whatever libraries it wants, execute more SQL, and then some program logic and so forth. So what would happen is that if we can take maybe these two portions here and then Im embed them as functions inside the database server, so then now we can rewrite our application just to, just to invoke you know, the queries and the functions like this. And then now there isn't this back and forth where maybe pulling a bunch of data, processing it, and then passing it on to the next query and so forth. I could keep everything always on, on the server side. Again, obviously for some things, like if you're calling machine learning libraries, like PyTorch, this doesn't quite make sense uh, to express everything as, as, a, as a UDF in like the native, uh, native uh, UDF language of the database server. Um, there are tools, there are extensions to Postgres and other systems where you can make you know, calls into PyTorch. Right? They, they basically have UDF wrappers for that. Like I said, we're going to ignore that for today. All right, so today we're talking about the background of, of, of the challenges with UDFs. Then we're talking about uh, three techniques to optimize them. The first one is going to be the inlining approach from Microsoft that you guys read. 
Then there'll be a follow-up work from other sets of Germans to convert UDFs into common table expressions or CDEs with lateral joins. And then we'll finish off with, with bashing and some numbers about you know, which systems can support the, these various techniques. Okay. All right, so I've already said this. Uh, user defined function basically is going to be, you know, take some input, do some processing, compute the output. But there's, there's broadly two categories of UDFs that, that we're going to care about. The first will be SQL functions, where the, the inside of the, the function is literally just going to be uh, queries one after another, separated by semicolons. And then the output of whatever this, uh, the, the function will be when you invoke it will be whatever the output of the last query is. Right, um, and so here's, here's input arguments. You take, you know, take the integers. There's this return argument which, that defines what you can return. So in this case, we're going to return a a, a, a tuples from the table that have the same schema as the, as the table foo, and then we have our computation, the function body down here. So for this example here, I can either invoke it in the as a as a as a query without a from clause or embedded inside the from clause itself. Or in some cases, I can put it in the where clause. Like you, you can put these function calls, calls anywhere. So this is not that interesting from our perspective today uh, because we can more or less treat this as like a macro. So like in this, in this case here, you know, they're calling get foo inside the select query. I can, the Davis server literally will, will take all the SQL queries inside the function body and just embed it, inject it inside of this thing instead of a, a nested query. All right. And then at that point, the optimizer knows, knows, knows what it's operating on because it's dealing with SQL queries, and it can do whatever it wants. Now you see why SQL Server doesn't allow you to do update queries. Because if I have update queries uh, inside of this thing, then that can certainly change uh, the order in which I execute things. And if it's a select query with updates inside of it, then th things get weird. The types of UDFs that we're going to care about today are going to be ones that are written in, in a external programming language. So the SQL standard specifies something called SQL PSM. As persistent stored modules, um, and that goes back to like the ninth. Yes, question. Another question: the, the, like when updates are permitted in the sequential SQL function. Yes. Does, does the DBMS enforce like strict ordering on like when they execute? Its question is whether the DBMS enforce strict ordering when you have update queries. I think yes. Like it literally is blindly just copying it in. Yes. I actually don't know what Postgres does. If you have update in there. Well, they'll just blindly copy it in. It's almost like a, you can think of it like a, almost like a view. Uh, in, in that case, there's rewrite rules on Postgres. They literally drop it in. But if you have update query, I don't know what they do. But yeah, you, you want to keep the ordering correct. All right, again, so the SQL standard specifies this thing called SQL PSM. And as all cases in SQL, there's a standard, uh, but nobody exactly follows it. Everyone's going to do slightly, something slightly different. Um, but at a high level, they're all going to look the same. All these, the, the built in or the, the standard programming language for UDS is going to look very similar to ADA. Because the story goes, the guy that, that invented store, or UDS to store procedures was really into ADA. If you've never heard of ADA, it's like a, a modern variant of Pascal. right? It's an older language in the 70s or so. But anyway, so that's why you have, like, you have, the, you have the declarative variables in the beginning. Right? It's all it's very archaic. But, so the SQL standard it has, it specifies SQL PSM. Oracle's got their own PL SQL. Postgres has their, 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 their own dialect of uh, PL SQL called PL PG SQL. Um, it has some Postgres idioms in there. DB2 has had their own UDF language, but now I think you can install SQL PL modules that look like the, the Oracle one. And the one we're going to spend most of the time talking about today is this thing called Transact SQL, um, from, originally from Sybase. Um, again, it's going to look a lot like the SQL, PL SQL or SQL PSM in, in the SQL standard, just there's those at signs they're going to use everywhere to declare variables, right? Whereas the you know, SQL P, PL SQL doesn't have that. So again, for more historical uh, background, Sybase came first. Sybase was out of the 1980s, and I think they were one of the first. Uh, I think they were one of the first data systems that supported UDFs. Um, Ingress had UDTs in the 70s, but Sybase had had UDFs. Microsoft bought a license to the source code of Sybase in the early 90s to port it to Windows NT to compete against IBM. And then since then, they've, they've, had, they've forked the, it's a hard fork of the source code. Uh, and SQL Server has been, basically been rewritten. Sybase is still around. They're still making a lot of money. But like, again, no new startup will say, hey, I'm, I'm going to use Sybase. It's, it's, it's used a lot of the banks. But for historical reasons, because Sybase had Transact SQL, that's why SQL Server has Transact SQL. 
There's other programming languages you can get, like in, in Postgres you can get like you can get Tickle, you can get Python, you can get Perl, you can get PDFs in any any arbitrary language. If you're crazy, you can get uh, you can get you, you write UDFs in C, which is a bad idea, right? Because uh, if, you, if you're operating the data system, because now you're linking in a shared object in C, which can touch anything in, in your address space, and for security reasons, it's a nightmare, and obviously for stability reasons, it's a nightmare. So in some cases, like in in, in Oracle, for example, you can write uh, UDFs in C, but then they again they transpile them to Prostar C, which is their their dialect, and then they run you as a separate process. So if you crash, you take down the UDF, not the whole system. All right, so let's look at an example here of what a PL SQL will look like, or sorry, a, a UDF written in, in, in this case here, it's transact SQL. Um, so this is a really simple, simple UDF where we're going to take a customer ID in, a customer key, and then we're going to discount the number of orders that they've, they've purchased over the lifetime of, of being a customer. And then depending on whether they spend a certain amount of money, they'll get a platinum level or they're like, like a regular customer. All right. And so in this case here, we're invoking the UDF inside of the, uh, inside of the, the projection output of the select statement. So you sort of think of this as like a for loop iterating over every, every single customer, and then they're going to evoke this customer level, level function by passing in that customer key. Right? And again, in this, in this, because it's based on ADA or Pascal, we, de we, de we declare our variables in the beginning, and then the at sign tells us that it's transact SQL. All right, so a lot of these I've already said, right? UDFs are great because they're going to allow us to, to break up complex logic in our application into separate functions and potentially allow different parts of the code in our application to be able to reuse that, those capabilities. Some scenarios also, too, some, you see applications written in different languages, like there's the mobile app and then, and then there's the, 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 the web server app. Um, in that case, they're usually always talking to a standard application server, but in some cases, you can go directly to the database server, and now, instead of having to re-implement logic in the different programming languages, again, if they're all UDFs, then you can just reuse that. We're already talking about uh, reducing network round trips. Um, and then for some things uh, where UDFs can be very helpful is that you'll be, it's easier to write some complex logic in UDFs versus like SQL. All right. So data analysis stuff is, is very common with this. All right, so this all sounds great. Why aren't UDS maybe more common then? Well, the number one problem that we're going to face is that the query optimizers, if the UDF is written in an external programming language like PL SQL or PLBG SQL, doesn't know what's inside of that function. Again, SQL is declarative. So it's, it's the, the SQL query itself is specifying, here's the answer I want. And now the data system optimizer can reason about the expressions, the operators within that query plan to make estimations on selectivities of the various computational steps in the query plan. But now if, if I have this, this function uh, that I'm calling in some language that isn't SQL, what is the cost of things? Right? So if I have like in my where clause, where value equals my UDF123. We'll say UDF123, this, this my UDF is written in C, right? Or even PL, you know, PL SQL. Do I know what the selectivity of what, you know, what, whether what percentage I'm going to match in this? You don't because you don't know what's inside of the function, right? So that, that's going to be the number one number problem we're going, to, we're going to face. The other challenge is going to be that we're going to have, it's be hard for us to parallelize uh, our UDS and take advantage of the, like, you know, it, like in a vectorized uh, query processing model or even running um, the query across multiple threads, because again, we don't know what's inside of of, of the of the function. Right? It may just be, like, we may end up doing an implicit nested loop, uh, nested, uh, nested loop join because the outer query is invoking the function once per tuple. And inside of that, now I'm just doing another lookup inside of that function to another table. It's basically doing a join. And because there's a separation between the SQL side and the UDF side, the, the optimizer can't have a holistic view of the entire query itself and you know, do all the optimizations we know how to do about you know, switching the hash joins and, and so forth. When things get really nasty, but fortunately they're not that common, um, is that some UDFs actually will construct a string inside of the UDF, uh, like to incrementally build up a select statement and then invoke it. You're allowed to do that in, in PL SQL, meaning I declare a string with select, and like with a bunch of conditionals, I'm adding a pending literally SQL to it, and then I execute it. In that case, you have no idea what you possibly, could possibly be doing, because you don't know what the SQL query is going to be until you actually run the function. 
So you're screwed. And for this one here, no one's going to solve this. Again, we, we did a survey where we scraped GitHub and we tried to see how common this was. It's less than 5%. It's not that common. At least, again, that's for a static evaluation of just looking at the UDS. Uh, we don't have numbers to say how often they're invoked, but I, we don't think they're very common. All right, so the, related to what I was saying before about this parallelization stuff, so if you can't figure out what's inside the UDF, and now you're just going to be looping over the outer table or the, the calling uh, SQL query, the outer query, and for every single you know, tuple inside of the outer query, you're invoking the function, you're literally calling the UDF one at a time. Right, for every single uh, record. So in the Microsoft world, the world, they call this row by agonizing row, R bar. Right? And as I said, if you don't, if inside of UDF you're invoking other queries that you can't see until you actually run it, then the optimizer has no way to be able to say, oh, I, this is just a join. Let me, let me combine these together. Or I'm re executing the same query over again. Uh, let me cache it and, and be able to reuse it. Right? So, the, so this has sort of been well known for a while that UDFs are bad. All right, they're, they're going to make your, your, query, your, your queries run slower. And so there's this sort of semi-famous uh, blog article from the 2006 uh, where they're very, very blunt and say uh, T, T SQL, that's transact SQL, scalar functions are evil in, in SQL Server. And they give a bunch of examples that cite a bunch of the problems that I just talked about, right? So here's one query that takes you know, 2,000, 2,600 milliseconds, so that's 2.6 seconds. But then if you add the UDF, it goes to 38 seconds, right? Just by adding a UDF. So, so the, the sort of the developers and DBAs of, of SQL Server and other, other systems, right? This is not just a SQL Server problem. They all, every system has this problem. Uh, you know, this has sort of been on for a while. And then Microsoft actually just came out and said it themselves uh, in 2008, so a few years after this one. So this is an updated article where they introduced a new way to do compiled UDFs. But in here, they basically use the term like, oh yeah, R bar, the row by exiting row. That's gonna make your queries go slow. Uh, scalar UDFs are, I think, the, the SQL incarnate or something, or e evil incarnate, like e evil personified. They're very blunt. And so, so Microsoft is trying to solve this problem for a while. Right, so again, this is, like what I'm telling you is not like a, any big secret. People have known this for a long time. And like, UDFs are so important uh, and, and make developers' lives a lot easier, then we want to figure out a way to try to optimize them. So here's another example from Microsoft. This is from the, the Freud paper. Uh, this is from TPCH uh, uh, query 12. And they basically took the uh, where clause that is just checking to see if the customer key, key is null, or, and they, just, they made a UDF that just does a lookup on the customer table and to see whether it returns back uh, a valid customer key, right? So this is like a contrived example because you're taking the original TPCH query that didn't have this UDF and you're, you're adding this one piece here. And so without this uh, UDF, the query is going to take 0 0.8 seconds, so 800 milliseconds. But if you add in just this UDF, which is really not doing that much, then it goes to 13 hours, right? Because again, the, the, the database server doesn't know that for this, I'm evoking this function and I'm just checking to see whether the output is null. Well, it's the customer key, right? Uh, am I doing a look on the customer table here? No, it's, so it's the customer key from the order table. It's not going to be null, right? But because it doesn't know what the computation is inside of this thing, the optimizer just gives his hands, you know, throws up his hand, says, okay, well, I probably should need to, I'm just going to execute this for every single row. And then now you get the overhead of, you know, that's pretty significant. So we'll see Freud in a second. Freud is going to be able to take this, inline it back into this function, and get this query back down to 900 milliseconds. So not exactly as it was without the, you know, without introducing the, or the, not exactly what it was before you added this piece here, but certainly not the 13 hours that they're getting before. Yeah. Yes? This is strictly a like, SQL UDF, right? Because you're inlining it, not, it doesn't have to. Yeah, so same as, th this example here is a SQL UDF, but I, I don't think that, in this example here, I don't think, because I'm declaring variables, and I have a return clause, this is not considered a SQL UDF. A SQL UDF, you don't have variables or returns. It just, it's just the SQL queries in, by themselves. So in that case, yes. If I got rid of the declare, got rid of the term, and just, and just got rid of this, this, this assignment to the variable n, if it, just, if it was just this, then that would get in line, and the optimizer could figure that out. OK, so 
how can we optimize this? Well, there's, basic, there's four basic approaches. Compilation we've talked about before, right? We can just take our interpreted, you know, take our UDF that we'd normally interpret. We could compile it into to native code, and that'll run faster. It doesn't solve our optimizer problem because now we have, although the function now compiled is going to be much faster, it's, you know, it's, it's still going to be a black box to the query optimizer. Um, and I said Oracle does this, and SQL Server already does this now. I've been, I've been did it since 2016. Another approach is to extend the, the programming language for the UDF to introduce pragmas or, or directives or other hints to the database server that could tell it what portions of the query could be optimized. So SQL Store, or sorry, SQL, single store uh, has, has their own variant of, of a PL SQL called, it was, came out when they were called MemSQL, so it was called MPL, the MemSQL programming language. But they have a parallel version where you can write UDFs, uh, and you can use them, and, the, and that's additional hints to the optimizer to figure out how to parallelize stuff. But again, as far as I know, for that programming language, the optimizer still sees a black box for the UDF. Inlining is the approach that we're going to talk, talk about today, is how to convert the UDF into some kind of declarative form that, is, that we can natively embed into our query plan as if it was just a bunch of SQL queries, and then let the optimizer optimize that accordingly. And then the last one is a, uh, is it actually predates inlining, um, but it was, was rediscovered by us and other Germans uh, a few years ago. You basically take the UDF and you convert it into the, a bunch of SQL queries that run in, in batch over multiple tools at a time. And then now you don't have the invocation cost of invoking this single function, now you're sort of operating things all, all together. Again, I'll, I'll show examples of that as we go along. So today's class, we're going to focus on, on, on these two. Because um, again, this is, this is quite different than everything we've, we've talked about so far. OK? All right, so UDF inlining, again, the idea here from Freud, and again, we'll use the term Freud uh, described because that's what it's called in the paper. I think in the, obviously, in the, when you, you pay for a SQL Server, or download a SQL Server, it's not called Freud. So if you look for Freud in the documentation, you're not going to see it. I think they call it just UDF inlining. Um, but again, the, the, the research name of the project was, was Freud. So the idea is that we're going to take our UDS and we're going to convert them to relational algebra expressions that we can then inline into the, the, the SQL queries themselves. And we're going to do this before we get to the actually cost-based search for the joins or in, in other parts of the query optimizer. Right? So you can throw to things that are like static transformation rules that we can, we can do this conversion, this transformation of the UDF into relational algebra without needing a cost model. Because we'll just let the and then let the query optimizer handle it as if it was any other query. So we're gonna, as I said, we're going to do this before, in the rewrite phase before we get to the cost-based optimizer, um, because our cost-based optimizer, in theory, in theory, uh, we'll cover this later, uh, should be able to handle these subqueries effectively. SQL Server is not going to be able to do that. The Germans can different the 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 hyper Umbra Germans can do this. DuckDB can do this because we, we did it for them. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that in a second. All right, we, let's talk about actually real quickly about these, these sub queries again. Again, I'm not going to say how to actually how to do it exactly the German way to do it, uh, but this is going to be the challenge. This is this is the this is what the the inlining approaches are going to leverage because they're going to assume that the optimizer will be able to take care of these these uh, these. Uh, these set, that's the sub queries. And then we're going to introduce lateral joins because that's how we're going to chain these things together to ensure that things execute in the order that they need to execute in the UDF. But again, th th things will fall apart if it gets too complicated. So again, sub queries, basic idea. This is just an, uh, a refresher from the intro class that we just have a nested query, like a select query. Inside of that, there's another select query. And it can be anywhere. It can be in the projection output. It can be in the from clause. It can be in the where clause. It can be in having, like group by, anywhere you want. And so the two ways to handle them is to rewrite the query to decorrelate and flatten them to joins. And this will be the best case scenario. This is what you always want to do, but not, not everyone can. Or you just pull out the nested query, run it once, put its results to a temp table, and then join uh, that temp table against the, the, the calling table or the, the, in, the, in the calling query. Again, some systems do this. Uh, like think of like if I have a, my, my where clause, I have something that wants an aggregate, like the max value of a column. I can run that once, materialize that as a, as a temp table, and then just join against it later on. And people, you have to do this when you don't, we can't support DAGs um, in your query plan. Again, 
we'll cover how to do this all uh, more thoroughly next week in the, and we'll talk about query optimization for the Germans. Question? Sorry. Okay. All right. So rewriting, as I said before, we take this guy. Uh, this is some query, and we have inside of our uh, where clause, we have a nested query. Um, and then we can pull this out and basically do a join. And we see that we're doing a join on uh, the orders table with the, on the user table. In this case, this person here, we would recognize that there's a, we know the relationship between the order table and the user table, and we realize, oh, we don't even need to access the user table because everything we need is in the order table itself. So in this case here, this is the best case scenario, that we went from a nested query. Instead of having to invoke this nested query for every single row, every single record on the orders table, we can just remove the accessing the, the orders table entirely, or sorry, the users table entirely. Right? And that'll be a big win. All right, so the other thing we're going to rely on, in addition to the nested queries, is through lateral joins. I think we covered that also in the intro class as well. I think the first homework required it. Um, and the idea here, a lateral join, is that it's going to allow a subquery in our from clause to reference a values or attributes in other, other uh, qu nested queries at the same sort of nesting level. Again, you can't do this in joins, right? Typically, if you have, I have a subquery join a subquery, those two subqueries can't, can't peek into the, each, each other and see what, they're actually, what they have. A lateral join allows, allows you to do that. And this is how we're going to be able to guarantee that, again, we'll execute the queries in the order that they're specified in, in the UDF. So they just think of that as like a bunch of like sort, of, sort of for loops where for each, each clause in, in a lateral join, I'm iterating over every single uh, tuple. And if necessary, I can then invoke uh, look do lookups on the, the, the previous join, or the previous table. So let's look at an example like this. So here I'm specifying that I have an inner, inner join with a lateral. And then inside of this nested query here, you can see that I'm allowed to reference the, the select query up here. I can reference like the, the, the order user ID and other things up, up in here. Right? So this reference here, OIUICD, is this one up here. And this first order is this one up there. And again, the query optimizer just knows that, OK, it just, it, the binder needs to figure out, OK, I'm referencing these things here. And the lateral joins allows me to, again, peek up to the one above me and be able to see what they have. This, this example is a bit abstract. When we walk through the UDF, I think it'll make more sense. All right, let's go through the five steps of Freud. So the very first thing we need to do is take our UDF, and we're going to transform the T-SQL statements or PLC statements, whatever is written in, into SQL queries. And for everything that, that's, that's in the, see, the SQL standard, with some, some exceptions are like, like, you can't use exceptions, you can't use other constructs. In the case of Freud, they're not being able to handle, handle while loops and conditional loops. But if clauses and other things, you can convert all of those things into the corresponding SQL queries, or SQL statements. Then we're going to break our, our UDF up into regions. It allows us to reason about their contents and understand the dependencies between those regions. Because their dependencies are then get expressed through these, through these lateral joints. Then we're going to go through and merge those expressions based on uh, trying to combine the, the, the multiple expressions within one region. And then we're going to link them together uh, with, with lateral joins. And then we take our UDF that, that's, that we put together through lateral joins. Sorry, take our SQL query that we generated with all the lateral joins. We're going to then embed that now into the calling query the thing that was invoking the UDF. So we're doing this at runtime. And then we just run this now through our query optimizer. So in all my examples here, so I'm going to show it through SQL statements, or like the conversions will be from the, the UDF st statements into to SQL. Um, as I said, in Freud, they're going to be based on relational algebra. But the Opfel approach, we'll see afterwards, they're going to do everything at, at, the, at the SQL level. So this is that example we had in the beginning where given some uh, some customer ID, we're going to do a lookup and say, how, many, how much money have they spent with us, and then what, what customer status are we going to give them? So again, the first step is we're just trying to transform the, the contents of the UDF, the, 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 literally the lines of code with semicolons, into corresponding SQL queries. So in the, case, the first case here, all right, we're declaring a variable called level, and we'll set it, the value to regular. Well, that's just a select query without a from clause, where we pass the constant string regular and assign it to an attribute called level. Right? Nothing, nothing special there. In this case here, next query, we're, we're, taking, we're taking the, computing the aggregation on the orders table, and we're going to assign it to the, 
to the, 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 the total variable. That's the same thing as just taking the, nested, the query in here, just nesting it inside of a, a select query, and then just assigning the, renaming the output to be total. So then that assigns it to the variable total. And the last one here, SQL itself does not have if clauses. It has case whens. I think MySQL might break that. MySQL might have if statements, but case whens in the SQL standard. So I can convert this if clause into a case when, uh, you know, when total is greater than a million, then we get platinum. Otherwise, we set, we set the, the output to null. And again, then we assign that to the level variable. Yes? Do we then lateral join all of these? This question is, do we lateral join all of these? Yes, we're not there yet. Two more steps. Right, so this part seems pretty simple, right? Like I, I, can, I can conceptually see how I can map things like, oh, a variable name, oh, that's just an attribute uh, name in, in my projection output, my select, select statement. So in this example here, it's, it's basically one-to-one -one mapping between like a statement in the UDF to a SQL query. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be multiple statements could get combined into a single uh, SQL query, or you could have uh, one SQL statement, sorry, one UDF statement get gen, you know, split out across multiple SQL queries. For our purposes here, to keep it simple, it's, we're just assuming one to one. All right. So next thing is now we want to take this UDF and, and break it up into regions, right? And then for each region, we're going to going to do the, the the transformation I just showed, where we're converting the the statement inside that the the statements inside of that UDF or that the statements inside that portion of the UDF region into corresponding SQL queries. So in this case here, I declare two variables, total and uh, and level. And then I have this uh, nested query here where I assign the output of the aggregation to the total variable. Well, that's the same thing as uh, in my, I generated a SQL query where first I, I assign level, the level variable to null. And then I have this, this, this nested query here where I'm going to compute the aggregation and then I assign that to total. And then now for this region, I'm going to assign the output of this nested portion of the query to this temp table called ER1. Right? It's an ephemeral temp table. In theory, it should, it should you know, reside entirely in memory. Right? It's not persistent in the catalog. It, it disappears once the query is over. So I can assign it into this. It's like a table alias in, in, in a query. Do the same thing with this ne the next region here. Right? Uh, convert this into this, the case when statement, and then do the same thing, and then assign the output into, uh, into this temp table ER2. But notice here now that my, I have this variable total that I'm now referencing uh, in, in the region above me. Right? So that's where the, this is where the lateral join is going to help us because I have basically now two, two, two nested queries, two, two separate queries here, but one of them needs to reference the other one, has a dependency going up. So the lateral join is how we're going to connect them together. Same thing, same thing for level here. And then I have this, this next piece here, uh, again, the, the else clause, all right, and it's just the inverse of that, where, where if the total is less than a million, less than equal to a million, then, I, then my status is regular. Right? Same thing. Total can reference the one up there. And then level, this level here is actually referencing what was passed before us in that one. Are we done at this point? What's, what's the last one? Return. Exactly, yes. So how do we handle that? Well, level. what's that? Select level. Bingo, he's a select level, yes. It's just another, select, you know, another nested query. So we can take all these now regions, we've turned to SQL statements, and we put them all together into one giant SQL query now. All right? And so, yes, I know I just talked about lateral joins. In the SQL standard, in the SQL standard it's not lateral join. The SQL standard is apply or cross-apply. SQL Server uses cross-apply. Postgres and, and, and SQLite and, and, uh, and Oracle, they all use lateral join. They're basically the same thing, right? So, all right. So, as she, as she said, like we, the last step was to do the uh, the return clause, but again, that's just a return. Sorry, that's just the output of the select statement up above that wraps all of this together. And again, in this case here at the very top, I'm referencing ER three, and that's generated down here for this nested query here, and they're linked together through the lateral joints. Yes. His question is, why is the else lock a different region? Because I think basically asking us because like in theory it should just be this, right? Because in this 
just trying to be pedantic in this example of like showing you the different regions, but also too, you could have, going back to the original UDF, right, you could have arbitrary things inside of this, right, that you could then not, you wouldn't be able to express through a, uh, the, through the case when exactly. But yes, in, the, in this case here, I think there's being overly verbose because they're also, they're going to say later on, once I get it to this form, to my query optimizer, the query optimizer can figure out, oh, this is referencing this, and you know, here's, here's this case statement, and here's this case statement. Well, they're, they're just, you know, they're disjoint regions. I could just merge these together. Because the optimizer already knows how to do that for where clauses anyway. But they just set it up like this. Other questions? So I have, I have you guys read this paper. We'll see the, the, the file paper in a second. This one I feel like I can understand, right? Because it's transforming SQL. That's, that's all fine and dandy. The, the alpha one would be way more complicated because it's, it's basically converted to IR, the IR that's used in compilers and, that, and PL stuff, which is not my area. OK, so now we want to actually inline the expression. So this is the original calling query that call, called this UDF. right? So when, when this thing shows up, we then just wrap this, uh, this, this customer level invocation that just basically gets replaced with the, the entire, uh, you know, this entire block here, which is the, the converted form of the UDF. Yes? I don't know why you would ever do this, but if you go to the previous example and in the if condition, right, uh, if you actually, if you, if you go, go to the T sequel, right, so instead of having that else there, right, let's just mm -hmm. say we remove the else and we say we always set level to regular. Mm -hmm. Of course, you would never do that in, in terms of as a logic. Like People do a stupid thing, so yeah. Yeah. So how would that work? Because uh, you would not know which level to reference to, right? Because there's an ER2 level and there's an ER3 uh, level. Uh, so you're saying, so if I give it this, el this else clause, and it's just. You get it just else, but you have the set level. So the yes. set level, your, 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 if, it, if it's greater than one, uh, 1 million, yes. then you set it to platinum. Yes. And then you set it to level equal regular always. No, no, no. So, so in that. Oh, so you mean give it the else and just have this be without it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so no, no matter what, you just overwrite it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just an example. I'm trying to understand how that would work, though. Like how would, how, because you are trying to reference re so, to different levels here. So it would, be, it would be this. I would just take set level equals regular, and I would generate this regular as level. Yeah. So then now in here, for my third region here, I would have that select regular as level and then as ER3. So no matter what happens here, then it just gets overwritten. And the question is, the compiler, sorry, is the query optimizer smart enough to figure out, oh, this, this thing, whatever happens here, it gets overwritten by this? Right. Who knows? We'd have to open SQL Server and see what happens. Yeah. But hmm? it, it's, it'll still have to use ER2 level of this, or it, it'll still be no, no, it, just, it literally it will be select regular, select constant regular as level, as ER3, ER3. ER3 level. No, 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 so in the else, in that block, exactly where I think. No, this case when goes away. If it, if this you, case when goes away. If in your example, it's just right. set, set level as regular, right, right, right. this goes away. It's, it's this. It's, it's this query up here. Select regular as level. Oh, okay. And then it just overrides it. And then going forward, when I put it all together here, then as I do my uh, you know, select ER3 level, psh, well, that's just whatever came out of this one. OK. So now, if you throw this to the query optimizer in the SQL server, um, what you end up with is this, this, all this cross applies get, get, get torn out and, and uh, Simplified into just a left outer join uh, against the uh, against the order table, right? So to, you're looping over every single customer uh, cu customer record, and then you do a left outer join to compute the, uh, the the maximum number of of or the total amount of, of of items that they bought. If they don't haven't bought anything, it's a, you get null. That's fine. Uh, otherwise, you then you then compute what the the true output is. Pretty cool. Again, I'll say this next week. For most things, SQL Server will have the best query optimizer uh, in, in the world. Not for some things, right? 
for joins, for, for nested queries, the, the, the umbral hyper ones will be better. And DuckDB is getting them. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll give a preview of what we'll talk about next week at the end of this class today. Right? So in this case, Hort, because in this case here now, what do we have? Right? We, we, there was an implicit join in our UDF that because we converted it into to this, this, this cross supply, this, this lateral join uh, uh, contraption here, that the query optimizer was able to figure out, oh, it's actually, it, it, you know, it is a join against the, you know, between the orders and customer table. And in, in particular, it's a left outer join because I may not always have a, a, an order record for a customer. And so now I can just inline or, in, you know, just do a join as I normally would do the hash join uh, really quickly that we know how to do. All the operations that were, that were tr previously a black box inside of our UDF are now embedded as SQL. And the query optimizer can use all the statistics and other information that it has to be able to reason about the selectivity estimates for our query. It's paralyzable now because we know there's nothing, there's no weird dependencies between you know, invoking this function, or sorry, this query from one record to the next. So all my threads could be running this, this in parallel at the same time. Um, there's no function call overhead of you know, setting up the, the call stack to go into some function for every single record. And furthermore, though they claim in, the, in the, the Freud paper, one of the big advantages of their approach is it didn't require any engineering changes or changes to the query optimizer itself. Because that's a whole complicated piece of, of machinery inside the database server. And then if you can avoid having to modify that, and therefore you know there won't be any regressions for anybody else, uh, then, then this is fantastic. So if your query optimizer is, is very sophisticated, uh, in the case of the SQL Server one is, uh, you actually get a lot of the same optimization advantages you would get in a what I'll call a traditional optimizer or a compiler, op, a co optimizing compiler, like for Clang or GCC. You basically get, get, can get the same benefits in now inside your UDF. So let's say I have a really simple UDF, given some integer, and I return back whether it's a high value, the string high value or low value. So I would invoke it as you know select get val as a you know passing in some kind of constant here, right? So by Freud, Freud this mofo. Right? I'm going to get, at least in the first version, something like this. Right? We have the case when statement. If the value is greater than, than 1,000, you know, set up high. Otherwise, give it low. And then we do an outer apply. We ignore what that is uh, on that. And we get, you know, we, we're returning back the, the string high value, low value. Well, the, in a query optimizer, or sorry, a, a traditional optimizer, it would be able to recognize that because I'm invoking this with a constant value of, what was it, 5,000? Yes. Yeah, 5,000, that I can do dynamic slicing and identify that I'm never going to go down the, the else clause for low value, and I just remove that dead code entirely. Right? In the case of the SQL query, it's the same thing as I've removed my case when, and I just have, you know, just spit out the, the constant value high. Then, I, furthermore, I can do constant propagation and folding. Again, a traditional compiler optimizer would recognize that, well, I don't need to. Uh, I don't need to concatenate high and value as separate steps. I can just put them two together at, at the very beginning by propagating the constant up. Same thing in, in our SQL query. The, the query optimizer could figure out, oh, well, this is just taking high, appending it to the string val. So why do that as, as, a, as an outer imply with separate SQL queries? Let me just do it in one, one statement. Even further, you can do more dead code elimination and saying, well, I don't even need to declare the, the you know, an outer query return value or, you know, setting up the variable and then returning it. It's just select high value. So again, you get, you get all the same benefits as if it was a, you know, traditional optimizer, but the query optimizer is doing this because it already can do this for, for queries today. SQL Server can, not everyone can. I don't, I don't think Postgres can do this. All right? Yes. Statement is, if this works so well, could we just stop teaching people uh, SQL and use UDS for everything? So again, it doesn't support everything. So as in 2019, this is what you can do. You can do declares and sets. You can have select queries, if, uh, if then else, or if else, uh, else if. You have return clauses in multiple locations of, of, the, of the function, which they can handle that. Um, and they can do all basic you know, relational operators, uh, out of operators, exist, not exist, is, is null, in, um, any, and so forth. 
They don't support exceptions, they don't support dynamic SQL queries, and they don't support updates. Again, in SQL Server, that's not a big deal, but in, in, uh, in you know, Postgres and other queries or other data systems, you could. So your original question was like, why do we even need SQL do, do, instead of just using UDFs? Uh, you, want, you still need both, right? There's certain things you would not, like, to do the things you would be, want to be able to do in a, on your database server, like your UDF is going to start making SQL query calls in it, right? So I, SQL doesn't go away. So this is the, the res, this is the result they had in the paper that they shared, where they uh, they had uh, a bunch of different workloads that are real, from real customers, and I think they got permission to extract out the UDFs and, and sample the data, uh, and they showed what benefit they're getting for for a bunch of UDFs by inlining it with, with Freud. So from the first workload, it had uh, 90 UDFs, uh, and about 82 of them could be, could, could be inlined with Freud. And the second one was 170 uh, UDFs, and 150 were compatible. And so you can sort of see the, the long tail here. For the first customer here, with only one, one UDF actually had a regression. And I think it's going to be because the, the SQL Server is going to choke on the, um, you know, going to choke on, on, on handling a, a large number of lateral joins. Um, same thing for this other one here. But like, this is pretty significant, right? Some customers are getting almost a, a 1,000x speed up, right? That's huge. That's insane. Like, you, that almost never happens in databases unless you like, rewrite your application or like, switch vendors to go from like, you know, a row store to a column store. To ha without having to make any changes to the UDF itself, just with Freud and inlining, the, the performance win is, is significant, right? And the inventor of Freud, this guy Karthik, uh, he was a PhD student at IIT Bombay, which is the best database school in India. And then he, uh, he was at the uh, Gray Systems Lab in Madison, Wisconsin with Jignesh, um, and where he worked at Microsoft on this. So they got it, the, the paper came out, I think, in 2016, 2017. Uh, I, know, I think the paper predates us, but they got it shipped in SQL Server in 2019, in like three years, which is, which is insane. So there's a bunch of his tweets that shows that like, People are talking about how like the, the benefit they're getting with Freud is, is you know 20x faster, you know significantly more. Um, or this case, the query went from four minutes to, to nine, nine seconds, but just turning on the flag says use Freud. Again, that's a huge win without having to make any change to your application, right? I think in the paper they talk about the overall compatibility or uh, support for UDS in all of uh, the top 100 D Azure databases. I think it was about like 60%. So 60% of the UDFs could be converted into, uh, could be in line with Freud. All right, so this is one approach. This is like, this is how to again take the, the UDF, convert it into relational algebra, and then, and then inline that. And I, and I showed how to do it through, through SQL. So there's another, yes, question. The question is, uh, what are the challenges of doing with scalar UDS versus vector UDS? Well, I mean, he's done it for, for scalar UDS, so he's limited the scope to scalar UDS. What are the additional challenges that prevent him from just going into vector as well? Scalar UDS is a construct in, uh, in, in UDS, like that you return a single value. Yes. Uh, if you return multiple values, they're called table value functions. Sorry, I mean, sorry. Yeah. Um, the question is, like, why can't you do this for, for everything? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, of course, I, I, don't, I don't remember. Um, most functions out there are, are scalar UDFs anyway. Yes? Are there any restrictions on UDFs to make sure they always terminate? The question is, are there restrictions on UDFs to make sure they always terminate? That's usually a construct of the, of the, the execution engine itself, like how long a query can run. So it, you, you set your time out to say, like, <laughs> UDF, the, the, the query can run for one minute. The data system doesn't care whether you're spending all your time in UDF or not. So yes, could you write an infinite loop in the UDF? Yes. Is that why they can't convert like, for loops and while loops? The question is, is that why they can't convert for loops? Uh, I don't think it's a limitation of, of, uh, of like, what, what a timeout. I think there's a section on limitation in the paper. And I, like, they have recursive function calls, so they can, you can sort of do for loops. The point there really is with the limitations is that there's a certain amount of memory, and they don't want the UDF signal to that. Yeah. There's a follow-up paper we're not going to cover called Agify, where they show how to do aggregations, like loops, with con loops in a 
in UDF. For that one, they're actually going to rewrite your portion of the UDF as a uh, user defined aggregate and invoke that. That's, that's like doing transpilation. We, we don't want to focus on that. And that, as far as I know, it didn't, never made it production. Exceptions are the other weird one, too, because they know they don't support Because like, that's literally like, it's like a go-to statement. You're jumping to another part, and they don't support that. All right, so I want to, again, I want to talk about how to do uh, SQL to SQL, or UDF into SQL, uh, using this FL approach from other set of Germans at Tuborgen. And then uh, I want to finish up talking about batching, which is a, another approach, alternative to inlining. So for this FL approach, what they're going to do is they're going to take your UDS, and they're going to convert them into uh, common table expressions, um, basically SQL statements. And this is going to allow them to do the looping that Freud can't do and additional constructs that, that Freud can't handle. So instead of actually embedding this inside the database server, they actually wrote this as a separate middleware, as a standalone compiler. Um, I can give a quick demo. Right, so if you go to that website here, right, you have on one side you have the UDF. Let me get rid of the, make it full screen. What's that? They call it lateral. Yeah, they're, they're always going to have to call it lateral, but they're going to be recursive, uh, recursive CTEs for this as well. So again, so this is the original UDF, and then this is what it'll, it'll spit out, right? And you see a lot of lateral joins and nested queries. So like I can do something really stupid. Um, you know, X int. And then it spits it out, and then you see now like it's including X variable. And it's doing some of the same things. Like it's setting up the variables in the same way that uh, we saw before. So if I change this to 99, right? Then it gets the same, this is very similar to what we saw in Freud. And then if I actually run this, though, um, so this is Postgres. So I've, I've already installed it. So here's the, here's the, the real simple function. And then I execute it as, which I can't see. No, that's. Right, so if I run it now, it takes about half a second to do the original UDF. But if I run their giant, um, the, the lateral join one like this, well, no, no, that, that, that's how that's how long it took it to install it. It was create function. So now I invoke it. Um, now we're taking what two milliseconds? Yeah. So in this case here, the UDF call in Postgres is actually faster than using their, their Freud one. Tell me yeah. Explain yep, 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 I got it. This is why I always use my laptop in, when I give demos in the class. But I want to keep it quick, right? And in this case here, there's the cost of just invoking that function, right? You see how uh, Postgres, at the optimizer level, can expand the SQL query because it's embedded inside that UDF. Right? And right, that, again, the, link, the link's in the slides if you guys want to play with it. All right, so this is a great little PLE and compiler -y, uh, so bear with me. And again, I'm not an expert in this, in this area, so like, I know enough to how it maps to the SQL stuff, but beyond this, uh, uh, you know, this, this is all, uh, you know, I can't go too, too deep in this. So the idea is that we're going to take our, 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 our UDF and we're going to convert this into uh, to a form card SSA. A single, single, sing, static single assignment form. Um, and this is going to allow us to basically, basically convert the arbitrary code that we had in our, in our UDF into some form that's going to use go-tos to define blocks of things. And then we're going to take this SSA thing and convert it into administrative normal form, which is going to use mutually tailed recursive functions that allow us to again, simplify the, the, the blocks of the regions themselves. Then we convert the administrative normal form, which is using mutual recursion, into direct conversion, recur sorry, recursion. And then that gets converted into uh, SQL using, uh, with recursive uh, CTEs. And then we, that produces our SQL query, and we run it through our query optimizer. So buckle up. We'll go through examples. All right, so this is a really simple function, this pal function. Right? Give it an x, give it an n. We just have this, the part we care about is this loop here. We can iterate every i and multiply, uh, multiply x by itself, right? by, by, to some power. So in the first step, we want to convert this to SSA form. It's going to look something like this, where we define these blocks with, the, with these labels, and then we're using go-tos to jump around where we need. Right? You're, 
he's happy. Look how happy you are, right? See you undergrad. Yeah. All right. This is what this is what this is what this is what, this is what they do to you. Um, all right. So again, uh, so in SSA form, as far as I know, we're only going to find each variable once. We're all shaking their head yes. Sam's here, yes. Um, and this is basically what, what, a, what a traditional compiler would do on the inside. So then now we're going to take our uh, our SSA form and we're going to convert this into administrative normal form. And this is going to allow us to have uh, tail recursion, meaning in the at the last statement of every sort of function that we, we can call another function, and we're allowed to call recursively ourselves and other functions, and those functions can then call us back. Right? So you have this, you can have this, uh, you can have cycles in this, right? So in this case here, for our while loop, you know, we're going to loop through and do our computation, and then we're recursively calling ourselves, but then once we finish the last one, then, then we break out. Right? And then whatever the, the return result is whatever the, 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 last, the last iteration was. Yes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And the question is, like, are we allowed to do computation before we have other calls? Yeah. So that, I mean, that's what this is down here. All right. So th again, this is doing mutual recursion, meaning one function can call other function, and that function can call you back. But we want to convert this to direct recursion, uh, and that's just doing another, another transformation. And that's going to basically now, where we only have recursive calls in the, as the tail, as the last thing we do within our function. And then the, we, the, the sort of the embedding, the recursion calls can only go in one direction. So run can call run, pal can call run, but run cannot call pal. And the reason why we're going to do this is because we care about getting the last output of, what the, the, of whatever this in our tail recursion calls, call stack. And that then gets as produced as the output to the, the, the select statement within our, uh, in our, in our nested queries, right? So the outermost query is going to be, is produce the output, and that's going to be the, the innermost recursive call. So, all right, so then we take this thing, and now we convert this into SQL. So again, I'm not going to go through all the details of what this all is, but basically you think of like, here's the, 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 the set of all the variables. Well, that's just this nested query inside of this. Uh, and then we have our, our if then else, and then this, this recursion call is here, right? And that corresponds to this, this SQL statement like this. Right, and then compiler magic happens, and, th and then this works. All right, so does it make a difference? Well, in uh, for this one, they didn't they they didn't have Freud, uh, so they can't compare against you know is their approach better than what what Microsoft is doing? They just compared how much faster their approach using the, all these NSCTEs is versus. Uh, uh, you know, just letting Postgres just you know call the UDEF uh, as it normally does, and in my example before, I showed how the my, my the trial I showed before, like for that really simple function, it's actually faster to just call the UDF. And sure, for real simple things, this doesn't make sense. But if you can, if you're going to invoke the the UDF over over a very large table, then now you can start to see the divergence between the different approaches. I would say also too that the I would, I would say that the reason why this is not, the, the performance gap is not as more significant is because, again, the Postgres query optimizer is not as sophisticated as, as Microsoft's. So therefore, it's not going to be able to do all the, 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 all the optimizations that I was showing, showing before, breaking it down, removing dead code, and, and other things. All right, so the last one approach I'm going to show you is batching. Again, so the background here, this actually came out of a 721 project. Uh, that Sam and, and another student were working on last year. Um, and the, the CMU undergrad sort of independently uh, uh, developed this, this technique. And then we found a, a master's thesis from the Germans that did Apfel that they invented this batching technique. But then we found another paper from, from the Freud guy's PG advisor from 2008 who actually invented it before anyone else. But in that version 2008 required changes to the query optimizer itself to make this all work. In our version that they developed here, uh, and with the with the the Tobogan Germans, the Apfel Germans, you don't have to make any changes to the optimizer, right? So the idea here is that we're going to translate the a UDF into a series of update statements. And we're not going to we're not connecting them together with lateral joins. It's literally like it's going to be one query evoked after another, and 
what they're going to do is they're going to do some amount of computation in the set clauses to then set values in a state table that's going to be as if we're maintaining those the, the, the equivalent to the variables that are in the UDF, uh, UDF itself. So when we invoke the UDF, we first create this temp table. We instantiate all the, uh, the attributes for each variables that are in the UDF. Then we have a series of updates that then update these variables corresponding to the computation that would be in the UDF. So we're doing that same translation we saw with Freud of converting the UDF procedural statements into uh, corresponding SQL queries. So this is going to be useful for any database system, which we'll see in a second, that is not able to do the decorrelation stuff that, that Freud and Opfeld rely on. Right? Being able to convert those lateral joins and get them down into the, uh, to nested queries. So this is a, uh, this is a, a UDF from ProcBench, which we'll talk about in a second. This is the, this is the a paper, a follow-up paper that the, micro, the Freud guys put out of a real benchmark that's based on all these UDFs they were seeing in, in real customers. So it's sort of a, a synthetic version of, of what real UDFs look like. So this is from, from their example here. The, the gist of it is that you're, you're, you're doing a lookup on, a, uh, on an item ID to figure out what manufacturer has, has sold the most of it. Right, so you have this like, select query here. I uh, say this, this is, this, there's, there are three portions here. There's three nested uh, select queries here in these different blocks. And then say this is the call and query that's going to invoke it, right? And so inside of this, you have, the, uh, you have some additional computation you're doing. And then for every single record within this, this query here, because you're trying to get all the, all the, um, the first 25,000 most bought items, then you, you're going to invoke the UDF up above. So, I'm not going to go through all this in the low level detail, but you think of this as like the combination of the UDF plus the calling SQL query will get converted into a sequence of, of SQL queries like this. And you can almost treat this as, a, again, like a, like, a, like a SQL function, although it has updates in it. But like, just think of like a macro, this thing would get embedded when you, call, when you call the outer query like this. So in the first step here at the top, here's that temp table we're creating. And inside of that, you see that we're, we're declaring attributes inside our temp table that correspond to all the variables that we defined, right? So we defined a, a man variable, count one, count two. All those are getting defined in the, in, in the create table itself. But then we're also going to have this special return Boolean that's going to tell us whether this, uh, we want the value of this, we want this record within this temp table corresponding to a tuple that was passed into us, should it get returned or not, right? So you can sort of think as like the, every single tuple in the, the temp table it's going to correspond to a tuple that would get passed into the UDF. So if I have a thousand tuples, like a thousand, uh, what is this, web sales of a th thousand web sale items or item IDs, then I have a thousand items in my, in my temp table. I'm just basically updating this giant state table as I go along. And now when I do all my computations, these, these you know, what was done at sort of one record at a time in my original UDF, I can now invoke across all of the the, the tuples that are being passed into the UDF at the same time. And they're all independently updating their state table. And so the way I would invoke this, this generate series is in SQL standard. Basically, it, it, you can generate a, a list of numbers from one to whatever, or zero from whatever. Uh, and I'm just doing a lateral join of that. So I'm sort of seeding the computation to invoke the, uh, the, to generate the result that I'm looking for and produce the output that, that I need. And that's equivalent to invoking it, uh, the original UDF. Yes. But you, can't probably, you probably can't do this for every single, like, you're parallelizing stuff. I don't think that's going to work out. I'm not a field guy, but I don't think it's going to work out for every UDF, right? Like, Stephen, it's not going to work, for every, work out for every UDF? I think it does. Because uh, even exceptions, you could handle that through the state table. I think this is more generalizable than, than Freud or Opfeld. Because uh, again, so you actually, you could potentially handle dynamic queries. Because you just put the string that you're concatenating to, to the SQL query, you could put that in the state table. It's a little weird, but like, you could do it. Okay, so I think I've already mentioned this, right? So the, these, these are slides from Sam from last year, right? So the Microsoft guys wrote the Freud paper, they wrote this follow-up paper at Agify, and then they put together this open source benchmark called SQL Proc Bench that was, you know, they argued was a re faithful representation of what the what real UDFs actually look like. Because prior to this, it wasn't anything. And you can sort of classify the, the, the UDFs into sort of two categories in the proc bench. The first are going to be uh, UDFs without any input parameters, 
right? So select max return uh, reason web, right? Nothing gets passed into it, uh, and I'm just invoking this once. And so in this case here, there isn't actually any advantage of using inlining or, or batching because this UDF is just invoked once. It's, there's really nothing special about it, right? The ones that matter the most is you have things like where, you, where we saw before, where you are passing in uh, a, a, some kind of input value that you're iterating over in the, in the calling query on the outside, right? So I think that when Sam did his analysis for, for looking for a proc bench, uh, despite Microsoft inventing the inlining technique with Freud, they could only inline a small portion of what's in their benchmark of these queries, because a bunch of them just it couldn't reason about and wasn't able to handle it. Or in some cases, that it, it did do it, it didn't actually get, it, get a performance benefit, because it wasn't able to, to do that decorrelation of the subqueries. Yes? So a question for Sam, actually. So was it because the if conditions were too complex, or was it that there was some things that it just didn't, like, there was declare set, and but there was stuff like that was in D-SQL that they did not support, Freud didn't support? Yeah, so I guess Andy's going to explain this, but essentially the problem is that when you get your UDF and then you inline it, you get a very complicated subquery with a bunch of lateral joints. And then when you put that into SQL Service Optimizer, it's unable to decorrelate that subquery, and then you get very bad performance. Oh. Yeah. Whereas if you use the German way of decorrelating subqueries, you can decorrelate any subquery, and you get really good performance with inline it. Yes. We'll cover that. Again, we'll, we'll cover this in more detail next week as well. All right, so this is the, this is the table we had in the paper uh, that okay, we, we just came out two months ago. Um, and we compared it against SQL Server, Oracle, DuckDB, and Postgres. So Postgres, again, just can't handle any of these things, right? Because the optimizer is, is not as sophisticated as, as the commercial ones. Oracle, we, 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 we'll, we'll just ignore. But in the case of here, DuckDB, well, DuckDB got, you know, could handle everything. How is that the case? Well, because last year, the SAM 721 project with two other master students added support for flattening nested lateral joins so that they can support the inlining and the batching stuff that we, we, we've been talking about. Oh, sorry. And furthermore, they actually submitted the PR to DuckDB that actually got merged. So when you download DuckDB, you're getting SAMs and, and other 721 students' code to handle the inlining stuff, right? Well, what about Microsoft, right? So inlining, you, you can see for, for these select uh, UDFs in... Uh, in, in ProcBench, again, the Microsoft benchmark based on their UDFs, they can only handle two of them. So what's going on? And the issue is that, because as Sam already said, they, they're not as sophisticated as, uh, their approach to decorrelating subqueries is not as sophisticated as this German approach, which, which we keep alluding to. Right? So instead, they're going to basically have these handwritten rules uh, that allow you to do the rewriting inside the query optimizer for different, uh, different use cases, but not all of them. And, as, and you can think this paper came out in 2001. It's before Freud and these, these computer-generated you know, monstrosity queries of all these lateral joins existed. Uh, so they didn't, I guess they didn't, they didn't, they didn't know, you know. These things didn't exist at the time. They didn't try to cover them in their, in their rule base. And they haven't updated it since then. So in this case here, Microsoft just simply, the SQL Server simply can't handle the kind of monstrosity queries that something like Freud or Apfel is, is going to generate. And so the German approach, which we'll see next week, it can handle any possible uh, uh, you know, decorrelation for subqueries. Because they're, one, they're going to be able to, uh, there's a convert DAGs instead of trees in the query plans, because it allows them to reuse the computation for one nested query for another part of a query. Um, and they're going to introduce these additional constructs, like a dependent join, to keep track of the dependencies between you know, two different where clause, from clauses and so forth. And therefore, they can take any possible subquery combination you can think of and throw it at the query optimizer, and it'll be able to handle this. DuckDB can do this because they're based off of what, uh, what Umbra did, or Hyper did, and then Sam and his team came along and extended sort of the lateral join stuff that we needed. So that's the preview for, for next week. Right? We'll, we're going to talk about why, how this works in, in, in Hyper. So the main takeaway, going back to... Uh, you know, this, this, this table here, inlining is fantastic but if your database server query optimizer can handle the, the large queries that this thing's going to spit out. And few can. Okay. So, uh, uh, again, I, I said this before, but like, this is a big deal if you, if you can get, 
if, if you, your career optimizer can handle the kind of things that, in, that AppFell or Freud's going to generate, then you get a huge win for, for speeding up UDFs without making any changes to your application code. Right? And that rarely happens in, in the world of CS or you know, of software. Um, so that's a big deal. But again, you need to be able to sort the German style, the Umber style uh, decorrelation. The, we talked a little bit again about how to compile the machine code. This is going to help some, some, some performance slowdown. But again, since it's still going to look like a black box of the optimizer, it's, you know, it's not going to be the, you're not going to get the best performance. All right, any questions? Yes. So it seems we still have some, still have some time. Can I ask a question about the code that we looked at for the conversion? Sure, yes. Uh, you mean this one? This? Uh, no, actually the one that we looked at for the, the Freud example. Oh. So they're going, going back to like this? Yeah. I was thinking this might actually not be possible if we have, instead of that else clause right there, the third one, mm -hmm. if we replace that else with a simple if condition, right? That just says if at total is less than a million. I think that's, yeah, a million. In that case, uh, if you look at the block over there, it says ER2 dot level. It won't be able to do ER2 dot level. It will need to do ER1 or ER2 depending on uh, whether that condition is true. So it'll become, it, it won't easily translate from the left to the right. So his statement is, if you have, a, now inside of this, another if to, nested if clause. Not, not nested, if you just replace the else with the if. Just replace the else with oh, the Oh, so, so th this, 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 this if ends, right. then you have another if. Yes. Uh, and then in that case, if it's less than this, uh, so if it's less than a million, set it, set it to regular. And then in that case, implicitly, then the value is is er one, which is null. Will it have to be, or it'll get confused? That's not statically checkable because you don't know anything about the conditional. The more it exhausts those branches, you can have an uninitialized uh, total or level at the end. Exactly. So how will it handle that? But the initial the level is initialized as null. Oh, then yeah, it'll just at the top. So you just then you return null. Okay, you see your arrow there, right there, er2.level, right? Yes. My problem is that the er2.level, no, uh, um, yeah, that. Yes. Exactly. That one will become some, will need to change. Yeah, that's okay. You can call it er1. But that's not the logic uh, that the UDF would, is trying to represent here, right? So, so you, if level less than a million, set to, set to, set to regular, right? right? So that's, that would just be similar to this. Right. Uh, I, I see what you're saying, because it would be... It's changed in ER2, and we want to access the ER2 if yeah. the condition is true, or yeah. we want to access uh, ER1.level if a different condition. I, I understand your point. Uh, you can imagine, I, I don't know if Freud does this, you can imagine just combining them if then else. Wouldn't it do the same thing? Like, yes. Go for it, yes. Yeah, so basically the idea is you'll have one table, which will have the column with levels, right? And then you have another table, which is going to say, okay, if this condition is true, then it's this new value. Otherwise, it's the level from the previous table, right? And you can oh. arbitrarily keep doing this. So each thing is just a region that refers to the column from the previous region. So it's basically doing the update. Uh, okay. So yeah. it, okay, it'll use another case within this slide, you're saying. Make sure yeah. you choose between those. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. All right, we are over time, so let me... Jump to. All right, so next class, we're going to talk about database network protocols. And the reason why I'm doing this after UDFs is because this UDF idea is like, OK, I have my application logic. Let me try to embed that in the database server. The Arrow guys and DuckDB guys are saying, no, 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 no. It's actually the opposite. Embed your database system inside of your, your application, and then use something like Arrow to get the data in and out very quickly. Okay. So the paper you'll read is from the DuckDB guys. It's, it's, I think it's on MoonDB like before DuckDB was invented. But it's basically showing how terrible existing networking protocols are for database servers and how that for OLAP queries, it's not the ideal. And then we'll see how Arrow will fix this and then a, uh, another project out of uh, Simon Fraser University. OK? All right, guys. See ya.